one of the more daunting tasks in the geographical sciences is trying to figure out the best way to take this relatively large sphere that we live on and project it onto a relatively small two-dimensional plane that we can study and analyze. In fact, let me give you a very quick thought question. What if you wanted to travel from San Diego, California to London, England? What path would you take? Which direction yields the shortest distance? Now, typically the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line, but how do you draw a straight line on a globe? For that matter, how can you navigate upon a sphere at all? Certainly, traveling to London, England is not as simple as saying, go straight, make a right, hit the ocean, and take another right, and you'll be right there. The way that we have overcome this apparent and challenging problem is with something called the geographic grid. The geographic grid divides the world into the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, which will give us a north-south component, which will provide latitude, and an eastern and a western hemisphere, which will provide a longitudinal component. The range of latitude will begin at the equator, which is zero degrees, all the way up to 90 degrees north and south latitude hitting the north and south poles. The range of longitude will be from zero as well, and we'll define zero at the prime meridian, which we'll talk about soon, all the way around the other side of the planet to 180 degrees, which is called the International Date Line. Lines of latitude are also known as parallels, and lines of longitude are also known as meridians. And again, we'll define all these things in just a second. Now with that said, every place on Earth has a geographic grid coordinate. For example, San Diego, California is located at 32 degrees north latitude, 117 degrees west longitude. And you'll notice, by the way, that when we put our parallels together with our meridians, we have a series of grids. And that's why this is called the geographic grid system. Now with that said, I'm going to take a quick break from speaking here with you. And what I'd like you to do is go to this YouTube video, which explains latitude and longitude in much more detail. Once you've viewed the video, come back to this lecture and we'll continue our discussion. Welcome back. At this point, I am extremely confident that you have a good understanding of what latitude is and what longitude is. In addition to that, you now know how to determine your latitude by using the North Celestial Pole Star as your reference point. The next question becomes, how do you determine your longitude? Determining longitude isn't as simple as latitude. Remember with latitude, because the Earth is rotating in a counterclockwise direction, all of the stars and objects in space appear to be rising in the east and setting in the west. All the stars, that is, except for Polaris, because Polaris is on Earth's axis of rotation, so we can use that apparent stationary star to determine our north and south position. Of course, we can only use it to a certain extent, you can't use Polaris if you live in the Southern Hemisphere because Polaris would be below your horizon. With that said, we can't do the same thing with longitude. Remember, longitude is our east-west positioning. So if all the stars appear to be moving in the sky east to west, we can't use them. And we cannot, by the way, use Polaris because Polaris is always going to be in that same spot relative to your east-west location. So we have to do something else. We are. We're going to use clocks and time zones. And let me describe how this is going to work. First of all, there are 24 time zones in the world. And each time zone is separated by 15 degrees of longitude. Now this 15 degrees of longitude is not some arbitrary number. Remember, the Earth rotates on its axis one rotation of 360 degrees per 24 hours, which translates into 15 degrees of rotation every single hour. So again, 15 
times 24 equals 360. Therefore, we have 24 time zones on the planet. Each time zone is 15 degrees of longitude wide, which equals one hour of time. Let's explore this concept a little bit further. Keep it in mind that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. In this picture below, I have three people. I have one person standing at the prime meridian, one to the west of the prime meridian, and one to the east of the prime meridian. According to this picture, the person at the prime meridian, their time is right around solar noon. Although I have a picture where the sun is directly above someone's head, solar noon does not always mean that the sun is directly above your head. Solar noon means that the sun is at its highest point in your sky on any given day. So, it's solar noon for this person at the prime meridian. For the person east of the prime meridian, it is actually afternoon. And we can see that it's afternoon because the sun is in the western sky. And remember, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. For the person west of the prime meridian, it is before noon. And we can see that also in the picture because the sun is in this person's eastern sky. And remember, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. So we're beginning to see time zones and why they occur. Based upon your position relative to the sun, that is going to dictate your time. And again, your time zone is going to equate to 15 degrees of separation if we're dealing with one hour of time. What I'd like you to do now is either click on this link directly if you're following along with the PDF notes or copy and paste it into a browser and watch the YouTube video which discusses in greater detail time zones, longitude, and how one can use the clock to determine your longitude. Once you've watched the video lecture, please come back to this discussion and we'll continue forward. Welcome back. At this point, you should have a pretty good understanding of what latitude and longitude is. In addition to that, you should have a good understanding of how one determines latitude with the use of the North Celestial Pole Star and how one determines longitude with the use of a good clock. You know, with that said, there's something in geography that we like to look at called the early voyage problem. And this early voyage problem had everything to do with longitude. The fact of the matter is, you're seafaring 400, 500 years ago. You need to know what your longitude is. You know that using a clock is going to be extremely beneficial to you. The problem is, your clock is either a sundial or a pendulum clock. Either one is not going to be particularly useful. Now, this was such a problem in sea voyaging that in 1714, the British government offered the Longitude Prize, established through an act of parliament called the Longitude Act, to anyone who could create a simple and practical way to determine a ship's precise longitude. The prize was eventually awarded to John Harrison in 1765 for his chronometer. And you'll take a look here, chronometer number one finished around 1735, weighed about 40 kilograms. Chronometer number four, finished in about 1760, weighed about two kilograms. And as a matter of fact, the modern day wristwatch that you're wearing today probably has a lot to do with the work of John Harrison in those mid 1700s. Now, before we finish up this discussion, I do have one quick side note. Here's an image of a world political time zone map. You know, we've just spent a fair amount of time talking about the 15 degree rule and solar time. But as you can see from this time zone map, the 15 degree rule is not always followed. Case in point is China. China should be about five time zones. Yet it's just one and it follows Beijing time. And the question, of course, is why? Well, prior to 1949, there were about five time zones in China. But at 1949, the Communist Party said, you know what, let's have one time zone for national unity. The point of the story is that oftentimes political ideologies or political needs is going to trump solar time and environmental reality.
So with that said, when you're taking a look at your clock, you might have to do two calculations, one for solar time and one for world political times. All right, let's move on to maps. The map, of course, is the primary tool of the geographer. It can fit in a pocket. It can give location. It can provide area data. It can be thematic and include such concepts as weather, vegetation, soil. You can even have noise pollution maps for that matter. You can have any type of thematic map as long as what you're dealing with has a spatial component associated with it. If it does, you can map it. Before continuing on, please click on the link below or copy and paste it into your browser to watch the following TED lecture by Derek Silvers discussing weird or just different. When you get back, we'll continue forward with our discussion. Welcome back. You know, preconceived ideas and assumptions can certainly blind one's view of the different sides of particular situations or concepts. Derek Silver showed this in a simple example of how different cultures will map different neighborhoods and different blocks. I want you to just keep that in mind. As we proceed throughout our discussion now, especially with regards to mapping, keep in mind the power of a map and the power of display and interpretation. Let's move forward. Now, of course, there's a big question with mapping. And the question becomes, how do you take this world that we live on, this rather large three-dimensional sphere, and project it on a two-dimensional plane? Now, of course, there's many reasons for wanting to project the Earth's surface onto a flat plane. Primarily, and of course, perhaps obviously, is that the Earth has to be projected to see all of it at once. And it's much easier to measure distance on a flat plane rather than on a sphere. Now, we're going to note that as we try to take this world and project it onto a two-dimensional plane, there's going to be good projections. There's going to be not so good projections. You'll have some projections which lead to a fair amount of distortion. You'll have some projections which minimize distortion to a certain extent. What I'd like you to do now is actually watch a set of videos. All of them are relatively short ranging in time from one minute to three minute, covering such concepts as projections and distortions and ellipsoids and geodes. Once you finish watching those videos, then what we'll do is segue on to our discussion of spatial data. So for now, I'm going to say goodbye. And what I'd like you to do is watch these videos and read through the rest of these lecture notes. And then, of course, read through the textual material as well. And then we'll look at how we can take digital information and put it on a map. Specifically, we'll be going over concepts such as vectors and rosters. Until then, I'll see you next time.